Good morning. A very warm welcome to the first session of day two at the Kolkata Literary Meet 2016. As we wait for Keteki Dyson, Martin Kamchen, and Shukanto Choudhury to speak to Shamantuk Das, I would just like to inform you that the bookstore is now open. And um, you could kill some time there. And all the book signings will be happening there, too. Thank you so much. Chart, Tagore and the world. Once again, with Ketuki Dyson, Martin Kamchen, and Shukanto Choudhury in conversation with Shamantuk Das. Thank you. First morning session of uh, Kolkata Literary Meet 2016. We have a very distinguished panel of speakers. Uh, to my left, uh, Ketuki Kushari Dyson, who writes poetry in two languages, translates from Bangla into English and English into Bangla. And really doesn't need much of an introduction, but I can see some young people here who may not know exactly how much she has done to popularize Rabindranath in the West, especially in the English language uh, speaking world. Uh, to my right, uh, Dr. Dr. Martin Kemshin with two PhDs. This is one of the things we joke about sometimes, who has done the same for Rabindranath in Germany, in the German language. And he started translating Rabindranath when he realized that Rabindranath's own translations of the poems, which were subsequently published as the English Gitanjali, uh, left much to be desired. And the translations from the English translations, the Bangla to English to German, inspired him to start work. And he thought he'd be able to dash off a translation in a few months. It took him four or five years. The other thing, of course, is that he's been living in Shantiniketan and working a little outside of Shantiniketan in Ghoshaldanga for the last 37 years? 30, 37 years or so? 35 years, for the last 35 years. So he has an intimate knowledge of the geography of uh, Rabindranath Shantiniketan. And he's written extensively about how the, sp the place and the space has inspired not just Rabindranath, but, Rabindranath, but people who come and still live there. Uh, and on, the, on my extreme left is uh, Professor Shukanta Choudhury, who I don't think needs an introduction to people in Kolkata, but he's done incredible work in translating Rabindranath. He's general editor of the Oxford uh, Tagore translations, five volumes of which were published. But Shukantada has recently moved into another area of propagation of Rabindranath's works, which is the digital text. And he is the moving spirit be behind Bichitra, which is the largest knowledge site, website, call it what you will, to a single author, where approximately about 97, 98% of everything that Rabindranath wrote in all their variations in Bangla and English, excluding his letters, are available literally at the click of a mouse and where you can compare different versions of text. So uh, Ketukidi requested me not to put her first in the line of fire, as it were. So I'll request Martinda to set the ball rolling. We'll have about 10 minutes or so from each speaker and then discussions and questions from the audience. Thank you, Martinda. Yeah, the microphone should be working. Thank you for the invitation, and thank you for starting the literary meet right with our session. And thank you for putting me together with two very eminent uh, personalities in the field of Tagore studies. I thought that I read out to you quite slowly uh, a short text on my translation work of Rabindranath Tagore during the last 25 years, so that you get the gist of what I want to say. And then later on, we can discuss this or um, elaborate this as it happens. German translation of Rabindranath Tagore began almost as early as English translation. While the English Gitanjali appeared in 1912 in London, the German Gitanjali forward in 1914, two years later. Yet these two translation ventures have a totally different cultural significance. In Great Britain, Rabindranath was a poet from the colonies, using the language of the colonizers who succeeded in expressing himself on the level of literature. 
In Germany, the German translation carried no such ideological and political baggage. In Germany, Rabindranath was not the poet of a colonized nation speaking to the colonizers. Rather, he was a voice from the mystic East speaking to the mysticism and mysteries seeking West. He was seen in the tradition of German Indology, which began in the early 19th century simultaneously with German Romanticism. German Romanticism had discovered India as a land of philosophy and wisdom. Hence, the German public of the early 20th century saw in Rabindranath an exponent of the philosophy and wisdom of India, not a poet. More importantly, the sympathetic German public saw in Rabindranath a fellow romantic and considered his romanticism as the entry point through which to understand and appreciate him. Thus, translating Rabindranath from Bengali to English and translating him into German are two drastically different exercises. In Anglo-Saxon countries, Rabindranath Tagore is a poet of renown because he did write in English and did receive the Nobel Prize for a book written in English. He is part of the colonial and post-colonial discourse, and his literary work can be viewed in the context of Commonwealth literature. Such contexts do not exist in Germany. Moreover, in present Germany, the romantic mold has become suspect after an excess of misguided emotions during Hitler's Third Reich. Tagore, the mystic poet, is still alive only in the memory of elderly people. Hence, without any cultural contexts, it is an arduous task to create a new, a truer, a genuine image of the Indian poet, which will also make him relevant to a larger German readership in our present time. The one valid claim for his rediscovery is that he is a figure of world literature. The translations done from the English into German did not substantiate such a claim. Hence, in German, such a claim had to be established and proven all anew through philologically correct and literally satisfying translations from the Bengali original. This has been my task during the last 20 years, in which five volumes of my poetry translations from Bengali to German have appeared in Germany. I've done only poetry translations, not uh, prose. I've done all my translations without exception while living in Shantinikitan. It was clear to me that I could do them only in Bengal, not outside, certainly not in Germany. Here at Shantinikitan, I have the atmosphere and the social environment with its emotions and habits, which are the backdrop of many of these poems and songs. This helps me to first understand and then recreate the emotionality of these poems. Further, Shantinikitan provides me with the expert help I need in order to know every shade of meaning and get the interpretation of the poems and songs just right. On the one hand, I'm here enjoying good Tagorean fellowship, but on the other hand, I am alone and lonely as a translator into German. No one in Shantinikitan can understand and appreciate my translations. West Bengal, where I live since exactly 35 years, since 1980, therefore has neither praise nor criticism for me. The academic community here 
hardly knows that for the last 20 years I've been translating one poem after another, filling five volumes. The community neither joins in my ecstasy nor comforts me when I am faced with the tragedy of translation. Let me very briefly give you some details of my translation predicament. In contrast to German, the Bengal language, the Bengali language, can dispense with the definite and indefinite articles, as well as with certain pronouns, which can be expressed through endings. Auxiliary verbs, too, are incorporated in the verb endings. This makes Bengali curt, compressed, wonderfully sententious, encapsulating one dictum within a few syllables. German does not have the same gift of brevity. Translating a Bengali line of verse often needs two lines in German. If you wanted to fashion a German poem, certain judicious compromises regarding the wealth and exactitude of meaning must be admitted. The claim to create a new poem demands from the translator to deconstruct all the components of the Bengali poem into a mass of meaning, rhythm, and rush, and then rebuild the German poem from that same material. Each line or each sentence needs to undergo the same slow transformation in the mind of the translator. If this process, if this progresses happily, and that means if my mind becomes fully attuned to the mind of the creator, Rabindranath, then there is nothing more fulfilling, more intoxicating than translating poetry. This is what I referred to as the ecstasy which a translator enjoys. The tragedy is that the translation is never finished. A poem may be complete and perfect, but never the translation of a poem. The translation has to be truthful to itself as a German poem and truthful to the original, a Bengali poem. This is walking a tightrope from which I may fall off on the right side or the left side any moment, even without noticing it. A special challenge is the translation of rhymed verse endings. In Bengali, rhyme comes easy as only few endings exist and so-called impure rhymes are totally accepted. In German language, so-called impure rhymes and half rhymes cannot be used. They are considered amatorish. Rhyming has once been the norm in German poetry, in classical German poetry. Modern poetry uses it too, but very infrequently. However, translating Rabindranath, I cannot abandon rhyme. Translating a poem of Shishu, for example, without rhyme would mean often missing the point, the fun, the banter, the childlikeness of the poem altogether. Even a Gitanjali poem will be only half as enjoyable and effective without rhyme as with rhyme. This means that rhyme has to be made a part of the translation effort. This is a tremendous challenge. Rhyme must come natural and easy without twists of the sentence structure, but not too easy either. Otherwise, a verse might become a mere pun on words, a kalawa, as we say in German. The need for rhyme drastically reduces the freedom of choice of words and increases the need for compromises regarding the wealth and exactitude of meaning. I see the work of a translator of poems as a special call. You must be something of a poet yourself to be excellent. At least you should rise to become a poet in the process of translation, assembling the elements of the Bengali poem 
into a new resplendent and self-confident structure. Often I felt an extraordinary union with the poem and with its creator, Rabindranath. In these moments, I was aware that translating Rabindranath's poems means communicating with the poet's imagination and his spiritual persona in a more intense, more intimate way than merely reading his poems. In such moments, I feel an almost aching happiness that I may not be a reader, that I am not a mere reader, but a translator of Rabindranath's poetry. Thank you. Uh, for that uh, wonderful talk about how lonely your task as a translator is here, and maybe later on there'll be questions about how your translations have been received in Germany. And you've spoken largely of the emotional content of translation. Uh, I would request Ketokidi to say a few words about the scholarship that is necessarily needed in order to translate someone as rich as Robindranath. And Ketokidi is eminently qualified to speak about this. She is herself a poet and a scholar of Robindranath. And for many of us, Robindranath's encounter with Latin America, especially Victoria Ocampo, became clearer after we read her marvelous book on the Tagore Ocampo encounter. So Ketokidi, uh, about scholarship and translation. Thank you. OK. Now, it's not that I don't want to talk about uh, any other aspect. In fact, um, I might, it might be a bit difficult for me, because I have got a vision handicap now. And it's one of the reasons why I'm a little uh, shy about, uh, I was a little shy about beginning anything. Um, I would like to say that this question of handicap has enabled me to, to see through the welter of problems uh, that we encounter when we deal with Rabindranath um, through the usual uh, modes and channels because the whole idea of handicap um, has, is connected to karma in India, which shifts our attention away from the reality in front to what did we do wrong in the past to deserve this handicap. So uh, you know, it's, it's away from the scientific approach of genetic uh, handicap, which we all have one way or another. And uh, I, let me begin with this idea of handicap as, I, as I, I acknowledge to you that I am suffering from an acute handicap. You see, Tagore also had uh, a handicap, and interestingly, a visual handicap, which is not acknowledged much in academic circles. He uh, was a, a protanope, that is to say he was suffering from protanopia, which is a, a, a form of color vision deficiency, not total color vision deficiency, but partial color vision deficiency. And myself and some other scholars have done an extensive and intensive study of this, and the result it has had on Tagore's language, vocabulary, sonic patterning, the way Tagore has all his life, since he became aware of the fact, because as a child, we are not aware of these deficiencies. But as we progress and we compare notes with others, we realize we have a problem. So when, by the time Tagore became aware, um, then his own struggle began to reconcile his handicap with, uh, uh, with, uh, with uh, his, his perceptions. And it really affected um, not only his visual art, which people think that if there is a problem with seeing, it will be reflected only in the visual art. But no, it is reflected in writing as well, in the, the way we handle language. For instance, how we describe our favorite colors and the colors which we don't see. If Tagore saw green, not as we see it, but in another way. But the, for him, that is the reality. So he's struggling to convey uh, f not only forms, but also uh, sound. He's pushing his perceptions through the sonic patterning that he is doing. For instance, when not only poetry, but poetry and, and literary prose has to be achieved through a mesh, a mesh of meaning and 
sonic suggestion, patterning, I call it, sonic patterning, patterning through sounds, which will give you a hint as to what you, you want to um, what you want to convey. So if the ghosts saw green and brown as approximating to each other, so how will it use uh, adjectives like say sham? The way if you if you um, look carefully at his texture of his of his uh, patterning of of uh, meaning and sound, you will find that he uses blue kneel he whenever he says kneel you you just feel that he he's seeing it altogether as others see it but lal and shobuj are two adjectives he does not use so much he relies on slightly more um, what shall i say not vague but distant words like you know orun and shamol and you are left guessing as to what he means um, what I think might happen in a uh, sort of post-computer uh, age uh, is that we could probably do more um, counting, enumeration, and computer checking of the rate at which he's using one word as an, an another. So that could be uh, an advantage of the computerized age for us, that we could put a little bit more quantitative uh, measurement into into this language, and not just a, um, a vague saying that uh, that he didn't see red so well or he couldn't distinguish between red and green. So in that way, what you call the uh, digital age, uh, no, I belong to the pre-digital age, and I don't use mobile phones, and I don't use send text messages, and I don't do tweeting and Facebooking. All this is after my time. But hopefully, as we pr progress um, in our understanding of technology, in fact, the computerization will help us to put numbers into the game and to see how many times has, has Tagore used this adjective, how many times has he used the other adjective, and how is he pushing his perceptions, his special protanopic perceptions, through the already existing pattern of sounds available in Bengali, and also uh, also the uh, suggestions that are coming from, say, Sanskrit or Persian or, or uh, other words. But so now for us, there is a question not only of Tagore's copyright, copyright but, uh, but Tagore, you know, if you make him into an icon, into a sacred image, then we push him away from the human. You know, he's there, he's Gurudev, and he cannot have any problems. But that's, for me, that's the wrong way. For me, the scholarly way is to understand him fully in his social, cultural, and uh, linguistic setting, and his personal setting, his protanopia, if he had, if he had, uh, if he had one, which of which I am convinced he did, his uh, biography, and people are still very reluctant to discuss biographical matters. Uh, and um, uh, connecting them, because I've had quite a lot of flack about it for doing research on Victoria Ocampo and so on. Um, but how, however we look at it, now is the question of the translator's copyright as well, because we are uh, not yet, okay, the, the transition from oral literature to printed literature happened uh, long before my time, <laughs> our time, but now, into this computerized age, we have to add other factors. And for instance, uh, as a, a Swedish uh, publisher has published translations of Tagore's poetry in which the, my translation is the, what is called in scholarship, the Ur text, that's the original text. And uh, they have, of course, acknowledged my name. You know that the, the, the such and such a translator exists. But the fact that instead of translating directly from Bengali into Swedish, this Swedish translator has actually translated very carefully from my, my English translation that uh, it's difficult to persuade the Swedish publisher to do anything about it because it is done, you know, and we cannot, uh, he, he wouldn't want to admit that what he has done without asking my permission. If he had asked my permission, I would have given it. But 
then the book is done, it is a fait accompli, and then somebody informs me, Ketuki, do you know what has happened? <laughs> your, your English translation has been used as, a, as the Ur text, and uh, you know, we call source text, and target la source language, target language, and all that sort of thing. Now, uh, the uh, other thing that happens uh, with this is the, the linguistic and biographical information are enmeshed together. I have a translated poem called um, uh, the, the, the very first poem, Suicide of a Star, Taroka Rattata. So that Suicide of a Star, um, in my first uh, edition of my translations, it was the star was a he, because uh, because in, in, in Bengali you don't have to specify uh, gender, uh, gender, number, uh, everything is treated in a slightly different way. So uh, I, there was a huge, huge uh, prejudice against, against identifying the star which has committed suicide as a she, because then readers might be thinking that, oh, um, it, is, uh, it is about Kadom Devi who committed suicide. Um, so I was very inhibited the first time. I didn't want to uh, enrage the Shantiniketan scholars or whatever. So I translated it uh, as a he, the, you know, as, as and when necessary. However, now in the second edition, I have reconverted um, the star into a she because I'm sure Tagore was thinking about Kadum Devi's suicide. And uh, I now uh, feel more confident that uh, that was uh, the correct way to, was to, uh, you know, to hint that it could, it could be a she. Um, so as translators, we now have increased uh, responsibility uh, to make sure that we are faithful to what we know linguistically, the language, there is so little attention uh, paid sometimes because people are continuing to, if somebody comes and translates a, a few lines of, of uh, Tagore and, and puts those lines on Facebook or Twitter, I mean, it may not serve our purpose. That, that is the spirit of the age. But we really have to move to real scholarship, which will include knowledge of language, uh, the knowledge of the culture, and uh, Tagore belongs uh, to the age of Jagadish Chandra Bosch, the scientist, the whole, uh, the whole Bengali cultural, socio-cultural, and broader Indian perspective. All that has to come, come into action, you know. And his personal problems, his the biography, his handicaps, all are have to be meshed together and understood. And to do that, you need scholarship. You need, you need sifting, is the English word. You need to sift the evidence. And you need to probe. You need to ask uncomfortable questions. Without that, we cannot go forward in this post whatever age. <laughs> because again, we, we tend to use these post words. You know, In my generation, we talk about the poco pomo effect. Poco post-colonial, pomo post-modern, you know? And also po fe, post-feminist, etc., which makes our head real. <laughs> so let me just say, I'm all for scholarship as far as it's practicable. But I know there is a limit. But why shouldn't we be true to ourselves as best as we can? Yes, translation needs an element of scholarship. Otherwise, it is going to be very difficult to rescue Tagore from, um, you know, what shall I say, misinterpretation. And yeah, thank you for being patient. Thank you, Ketakidi. Uh, I think uh, we have nicely sort of moved from one kind of translation to another scholarship, and particularly Ketakidi's mention of the possibilities opened up by digital scholarship and parsing and analysis, but also the way in which digitizing texts helps them reach a much larger audience. And there is no person better equipped and better experienced to speak about this than uh, Shukantada. So. Can you hear me? Is this carrying? You can, no. Well, why don't I take this one then? This one, better? Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Shomantuk. And um, yes, the sequence is, uh, I suppose, uh, the logical one, sense. Um, so I will not, in fact, talk very much about um, 
my involvement in the work of Tagore translation of the traditional kind, the five volumes of the Oxford Tagore translations, of which I was a general editor and part contributor, but there was a very large and distinguished panel of translators for the various volumes. But um, uh, I mean, I would, in this, the very short time we have, and this necessarily, therefore, this kind of uh, overview that we have to take without going into detail, um, I, I don't want, as it were, to sort of do all too briefly and inadequately what Martin and Ketukidi have already done uh, before me. Um, but I would just like to say that my work with Tagore translation, I think, led on to my subsequent work in the digitization of Tagore's corpus, uh, because you know, something most embarrassing to say uh, with reference to a writer of Rabindranath's stature, but my, uh, I mean, what first drove me to translation and let it, later on to creating a digital uh, a database, uh, well, a database is always digital anyway, uh, was not simply or not even primarily an interest in Tagore, the author, as an interest in language, the way language works, the way words work, the way words are combined into texts. And obviously, that is the kind of uh, investigation that is best carried out by looking at the almost uniquely intensive and extensive treatment of uh, language in the works of any great writer, as it may be Rabindranath, who combines that intensiveness with extraordinary extensiveness, just the uh, sheer size of his corpus. And also, I mean, when he found time to do all this is a, a problem we shall never solve, the innumerable revisions to which he subjected his works. So while translating a particular poem, one obviously has to focus on the language of that poem itself, because that is what you're directly translating. That is your own, uh, your only primary data. But at the same time, you cannot do it without looking at other works by the same writer. And especially in the case of such an extensive and varied author as Tagore, this is particularly true. Uh, Rabindranath's works have an exceptionally sort of self-referential quality. You know, one work links up with another. One poem links up with another poem. Or a poem leads you on to something he has written in an essay or in a piece of fiction uh, between his fictional writings and his historical and political non-fictional writings. It's a sort of web of correspondences, of links, so that I mean, this is true of any great writer. I mean, T.S. Eliot said that the major poet is a poet, the sum total of whose works is greater than the, uh, the, the, the total of the individual parts, as it were. Uh, but it is perhaps uniquely true of Rabindranath. And that's why I've been thinking of a very long time of a medium where the entire corpus of Rabindranath's writings in all its variations, in all its variant forms, could be brought together. And the opportunity came for my colleagues and I at the School of Cultural Texts and Records at Jadhapur University uh, at the time of Tagore's 150th birth anniversary when the government of India um, very generously funded a project whereby we could bring images of all Rabindranath's manuscripts and significant editions of his printed writings a total of something like 140,000, 1 lakh 40,000 pages of primary material. And also we were able to hire a, you know, an army of extraordinarily capable and dedicated young people uh, who over two years worked, first of all, to key in this entire body of texts into you know, electronic files, you know, into text which the human reader could read easily, which was not always possible with the, with the original appearance of the manuscripts. At the same time, text which the computer could read. And then also, we needed to provide certain tools to the user of this database. The most obvious tool was, of course, to provide a bibliography. Now, when you're gathering this enormous quantity of data, see, 
140,000 images for a start. They have to be stored in a systematic way, see, as files and then folders incorporating those files in the directory structure of the computer. So it necessarily has to be entirely systematic. I mean, my first computer teacher, uh, I, I attended my first computer class at the age of 38. The, 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 I belong to the generation just slightly, uh, I mean, the same generation as Ketoki, they're slightly younger. I mean, the, 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 the computer provided us with a kind of midlife crisis, so to it. it was something completely new in our lives which we had to come to terms with. And I remember the first teacher I had in my first class said, remember the computer is an idiot. The computer is a machine, it has no intelligence. You have to explain everything to it in the clearest possible term, ultimately in terms of zero and one, the binary code, which is all the computer can understand. So all the files have to be stored in a crystal clear form within the computer, but only in a form that the computer can read. Human beings cannot read that. But then you can convert, you have to then convert the, the computer, that computer readable directory into a form which human beings can access and interpret. And further, if they are to use this huge database with any degree of ease, then once they've located a particular title and a particular version and edition or a manuscript of the title, they have to be able to click on a particular link and access the actual images of that manuscript or that book or a clear reading text. So we had to provide that bibliography with links the way through, making it in technical terms a hyper bibliography. The next thing we had to do, and this actually answers a question Ketukidi raised, was to provide a search engine, which was done, believe it or not, by two undergraduate students of Jadapur University in the computer science department. So that now, um, what Ketukidi was talking about in the future tense has in fact become, became the present tense about three years ago. You can actually, using the Bichitra website, a search engine, locate every occurrence in Rabindranath of a particular word or a particular phrase. It'll, uh, in the fraction of a second, it will show up on the screen. And then you can, if you like, click on the link of any one of those references, it may be five, it may be 50, it may be 500, um, 5,000, depending on how common the word is. You can click on a link and at once the entire text of that work will open up in front of you. And finally, the last uh, tool which we have provided uh, for the, uh, the user, I think the word reader is no longer relevant, is a collation engine. In other words, uh, a software whereby you can compare the different versions of a work. To go was this indefatigable reviser. There's manuscripts, then between manuscript and text, between one edition of the text and another. The maximum number of variations we found were in certain songs which have no fewer than 20 versions each. Uh, some only subtly different, some widely different. To, uh, to give one example, I don't have time to go into it in detail, but go to Bichitra and find out. Just look at an early manuscript draft which Rabindranath wrote in, uh, uh, or which I think it is in Indira Devi's handwriting, in the Indira Devi's book of songs, or the Kanir Bohi, of the song Tumishon Dharo Meghomala. And you'll find that the song is stood on its head by the change of a, maybe 10 or 12 words in the poem. Instead of being what it normally is, a song by a male lover to a female beloved, it becomes the opposite. And maybe, therefore, the call of Radha to Krishna. I mean, you, if you just sort of play around with the collation engine, you come across extraordinary insights into the action of Rabindranath's creative genius. See, and we are so glad that you could do it because, uh, you know, I mean, there is this completely false um, opposition which is sometimes drawn between the supposedly emotional and human appeal of literature and its mechanization and oversimplification if it's put into computers. The computer is your best tool, your only tool, for tracing minutely, uh, minute variations and detailed complexity of any object, including literary texts. 
there can be no better tool than computers if used in the right way. Of course, if it is the wrong way, it can be disastrous. And so much uh, of, uh, computer uh, literate analysis and computers is disastrous. But if it used in the right way, it can become a magnificent tool. And we hope that through Pichitra, we have been able to provide this tool. Uh, thank you, Shukantoda. I think uh, because we started a little late and we ought to try and stick to the time because many events follow this, I'll open the session for questions from the audience. But before that, if the speakers have anything to say to each other, maybe we can we can take that if you would like to comment on, on your various presentations. And then we'll take questions from the audience. I'll request the organizers to have someone with a microphone uh, to give to people in the audience who want to ask questions. So. Shokantara, just in one information, has after Pichitra has been completed, already research started in the way you are suggesting? Are there scholarly works emerging out of this? Um, well, I don't know. I mean, uh, in one sense, it's too early to say. Uh, but one thing which has encouraged us very much is that you know, the younger generation of teachers of Bengali literature across the colleges and universities of Bengal have taken a great interest in this. So they've often called us over to sort of explain the operation of Bichitra to them, uh, because they, of course, are very computer savvy. And so we hope that such research will result. And also, there is one other factor, which is maybe truer in Bengal, and certainly with respect to Rabindranath, than with an author like Shakespeare in England or you'll be able to tell me whether it's true of an author like Goethe in Germany, and maybe it's not quite true of Dante in Italy, the rest of my knowledge, which is that is not just uh, a bit bridging the what might have been a gap between the scholarly uh, analyst and the totally uninformed general reader. There is a body of informed general readers. Many of our best experts on Tagore, I'm not just saying lovers of Tagore, but knowledgeable experts on Tagore are not academics. They are general readers of Tagore. And I think many such people, at least the more computer savvy among them, are using Bichitra. So let us hope that this bridge will be gapped even further. Uh, the, I'd, I'd also like to add to that that Bichitra has become incredibly useful and very widely used by students. I, I have several courses at Jadavpur where, where we talk about Rabindranath. And earlier it used to be, you know, refer to this essay, and you'll find it in that, uh, the, the West Bengal uh, Rachanaboli of 61, which is available in this particular library. And you go there, and you don't find the volume. Now I say, you know, go to Bichitra, do the search, and the next day they come to class. Earlier it used to be printouts. Nowadays they've all got their smartphones, and they're saying, I've, I've, I've got the text with me. You know, so that is useful. The second thing which, which uh, needed to be said, which Shukantada omitted due to his characteristic modesty, is that Bichitra is entirely free. You don't have to sign up for it. You don't have to pay a use fee, which means that there may well be scholarship going on of which we are completely unaware. Because in other sites, you have to register and say, I'm doing this, and I'm doing that, I'm so and so. And so you can actually keep track. But we can't. So you know, there are several hundred thousand users of Bichitra. And I'm absolutely certain that they are using it for research, which is kind of oriented to this. And I'm sure that this will grow. Could I could just contribute one fact, then I did just not keep talking about Pichitra alone, but one which is that the number of hits has been growing incrementally. It took us 11 months to reach the first one lakh hits, but then in the sort of 18 months since then, uh, it has now progressed to nearly 4 lakh hits. I think very soon it will touch 4 lakhs, it's about 3 lakhs, 88,000, something like that at the moment. So clearly it is being used more and more. Anyone from the audience had questions for? Yes. <coughs> My question is to Ketu Kibi. Very often it is said translation is a sort of a traitor. And in poetry particularly, rhythm and rhyme 
are the casualties. Do you agree with this point of view? What I would say is that we need sonic patterning through which the meanings are expressed or heightened. And this sonic patterning cannot be done without close knowledge of the source language and the target language. Because you're talking about poetry translation, we are thinking of creating a pattern which will encapsulate all these little details. I mean, as I was talking about Tagore's partial color vision deficiency, so he is conscious, con, uh, constantly adjusting and readjusting. Why do you think he's all the time revising himself and crossing this out and putting in? Because he's not satisfied, exactly as in his visual art. Uh, he's crossing something off. He's doing another design. And all, to do all this, he is fighting with himself. He's trying to find a, a combination of rekha and wrong, which will be close to his perception of the world. So some of this perception, some of his internal struggles are reflected in, in what he's doing. And of course, the better you understand the details. I am a fanatic for details. The better you understand these details, the better you will be able to cope with translating. Just as Tagore himself was trying to come to terms with his particular vision, vision and uh, his visual world, he was trying to represent it true to his own perception. But if we do not know that Tagore had this problem, we would not locate it or hold it that this is one reason why. So I think we need a mesh, a mesh of all these things. You know, sonic patterning, knowledge of the original language, knowledge of the target language. Uh, yes, truth, sometimes translating from the English versions that were prepared by Tagore himself. Tagore himself has moved away from the original because he's, he's hearing a sort of biblical prose language, prose translation, which he thought was what the British public needed at that time. But let's, let's be more scholarly. Let's be more detailed. Let's grab the, you know, the bullock by the horn or whatever, and be, be without fear in saying, here yeah, he's trying to do this. Here he's trying to do that. Here he's trying to come to terms with himself. He's trying to come to terms with the language available to him. And he's twisting it this way and that way so that he's satisfied that this expresses what he is experiencing and viewing. And that, that encompasses the sensual world and as all, also the emotional world. And in the long run, we cannot separate them. They have to be expressed through language. And so the, the more scholarly we are, the better we will translate. I, th I, <laughs> I believe that. But then I am really hooked by uh, details and how we con con um, convey those details. But I think, you see, why is Tagore so fussed about these details as well? Because they're emotional, biographical, perceptual, uh, all these issues meshed together. And let us keep it that way to be true. Uh, to, to the reality of Tagore. Thank you. Um, I think there's something which Martinda said, uh, which also refers to, he said the translation is never finished, you know, echoing Walter Benjamin, perhaps. I had a question for you. I'm going to use my space on the stage to, to <laughs> exclude some of you out there, which is, you know, you spoke about your loneliness and you spoke about the lack of receptivity for you in Bengal. You know, understandably so, because we don't know German. But what is the situation in Germany? How have your works been received in Germany? Is Are people reading Rabindranath in Germany at all? I mention this because I discovered about a year ago that in Korea, in South Korea, every single school child knows Rabindranath because one of his very short poems, and one is not even sure whether he wrote it, is part of a textbook which 
junior school kids read in Korea. So ev every one of them knows uh, Rabindranath, and then presumably some of them go on to read his other things. And a lot of Rabindranath has been translated into Korean, unfortunately, as in the case of Sweden, from English. So I was wondering, I I are people reading Rabindranath at all in Germany? Well, the very fact that five volumes of Tagore translation, of poetry translation, has come out in the last uh, 15 years, is points to the fact that Tagore is indeed being read. Now, poetry as such does not sell well. Anywhere. Anywhere. <laughs> not here, not there. So, taking this into consideration, that there has been a new start of Tagore translation from Bengali into German is a, a fact which should not be ignored and which is very important. We cannot expect a transition from the old timers who have read the Tagore translation in the 30s and before the World War and maybe in the last, uh, in the 50s after the World War, who read the English translation, which were as they were, it, to a transition to a translation done by me and Alok Ranjandas Gupta, who has also done this, is um, takes time. Last year, just one more sentence, last year I tuned into the Austrian radio station, Vienna, and discovered that there was a one hour program of Tagore translation done by me, poetry, by the best known actor of the Vienna stage present today. And I was astonished that this is happening, you see. That's good news. So, any, anyone else in the audience? There, there was a, there was a lady. I've got a uh, My uh, question is that uh, Gurudev had a lot to do with history or what was happening in the country when he wrote all those songs. A lot of, lot of his songs came out from historical facts. For instance, when uh, Bengal got divided in 1905, I believe he wrote a couple of songs on that. And when Bangladesh was formed, but before Bangladesh was formed, about Bengal and so on and so forth. Can Bichitra give us a perspective on those lines as to what made him write those songs? Uh, no, B B Bichitra is not a, a too, uh, it does not carry out any, any analysis. Bichitra presents you with the primary material. It presents you with all the different versions of all the works. It provides you with a few basic tools for finding your way through these works. But it does not actually carry out any analysis. It cannot. A computer cannot carry out, uh, cannot c carry out any critical judgment. Okay. It can only offer the material out of which it is for the human uh, reader or user to form such judgments. Okay. Uh, I should say that there is some background material is now available in another database which is being brought out by the Robindro Tito, uh, the new center set up by the West Bengal government at Rajarhat. This is a website called Robi Sharoni. It is worth looking at, though as yet it does not have that much material. There was an attempt to link it to Bichitra, but that seems to have fallen through. Uh, but Robi Sharoni is a website of great potential, which will offer you the background facts, which you can combine with the texts of Tagore and its analytic tools, which you find in Bichitra, to form your own critical and historical analysis using the human brain. A young lady there who's been waiting for a while. Quick question. Um. Uh, my question is to Martin, sir. I was quite curious to know what inspiration drove you to translate Rabindranath Tagore's work to German, or rather, I would put it in this way: that uh, when did Rabindranath Tagore happen to you? Thank you. When did Tagore happen to me? Tagore happened to me when I read the German, the English translation done by Rabindranath himself, and while learning Bengali at Shantiniketan, comparing this English version with the Bengali, and I was astonished what a difference it is. I was astonished that at the quality, at the difference of the quality, and that a man like Rabindranath got the Nobel Prize for material which is actually inferior to his original. And I thought there should be some amendments, some correction of this 
at least in the German-speaking countries, and see the true colors, the true quality of Rabindranath's work, as opposed to the translations which had happened before. Thank you, sir. Um, we'll, we'll have to uh, call it a day. Yes, the next session awaits. So thank you very much. And uh, thank you, Martin Kempshin, Ketuki Kushari Dyson, and Shukanta Chaudhary. The lady has grabbed the mic at the end. So the final question. I think they may have deliberately cut you off, but try. Do you only translate Rabindranath or other poets as well? I have translated Sri Ramakrishna Katamrita, all the five volumes, from Bengali to German. It has come out in 2008. It took me 20 years, lots of work. And then Rabindranath, but nobody else. Ramakrishna said, Joto Moth, Toto Poth, but there is only one moth, and which is that we have to leave now. Thank you for being such a kind audience.